Good morning. As soon as Pam closes that door back there, we'll start. And she's about to do that. Uh. We're in Ephesians chapter 2, the first 10 verses this morning. We may or may not get to all of them. You know, if I understood everything that Paul says in the first couple of chapters of Ephesians, uh, I'd probably get paid to do something, but but I don't but I don't understand uh, all that Paul has to tell us. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, work through this. But now now looking back a little bit from last Sunday, we Paul addressed the Ephesians as a group of believers. Because they did not know they had. They did not understand their wealth in Christ. And you know what the first thing I thought about when I began to think about that? I don't bring this thing to church because I'd probably leave it on. It'd go off in the middle of the service. But this is an iPhone. Do you realize that I know how to do three things on this thing? I know how to answer the phone text, and I can read an email. Beyond that, I have no idea of the riches that's in this phone. There must be 10,000 things it'll do that I have no idea what they are. And <laughs> Jack said more than that. But you see, this, this is where, this is where the, the Ephesians were. Because they did not understand everything that God had for them. Just like I don't understand everything this phone has got for me. This phone will do miraculous, marvelous things. Except I just don't know how to do them. That's why we call our granddaughter, our grandsons, to what's going on with this phone. See, Paul pointed out to the Ephesians that, that salvation is God's plan. It's God's plan. We, we had nothing to do with it. It, it. There's nothing we can do about that. It, and without God, mankind is hopeless, guys. And so, Paul points out this morning that we are the demonstration of God's grace this morning. We are. Not by deeds we do, but by the trust we place in Christ. And we can't take any credit for salvation. You realize that, don't you? We can do nothing that, 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 that deserves us. Only the work of Christ on the cross is going to change anything like that. It, it's, only going to make, it's the only thing that makes you acceptable to God. So, so having described our spiritual possessions in Christ last week, now Paul turns to our spiritual position in Christ, our position in Christ. He explains that what God has done for all sinners in general. He explains that God, what God did for the Gentiles in particular. And what have we done in particular? He's raised us from the dead and seated us on the throne. We'll see that in the first three verses of that. Let's, let's read that now. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> and you, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. Now, that's what we were dead. We were dead in Christ. And we were spiritually dead. Now, we're, able, we're, we're unable to understand spiritual things and, and appreciate spiritual things when we're dead in Christ. 
Now see, we, we possessed no spiritual life whatsoever. We were just like the Ephesians. They possessed no spiritual life whatsoever. See, a person physically dead does not respond to physical stimulus. A person spiritually dead is unable to respond to scriptural, spiritual things. Now, God, don't think that this is cruel, but, but you, you, you can go into every funeral parlor in town and the dead there don't hear a word you say. They don't know what's going on. I mean, you can, you can preach the best sermon of your life in there. They don't hear a word of it. Now, the cause of this death is trespasses and sin. Trespasses and sin. Romans 6, 23, what does it say? The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. I, I want to. In the Bible, death means separation. If you, death means separation, guys. It's not only physical, but also spiritually. James two twenty six says this: For just as the body without the spirit is dead. He's talking about also the faith there, but just as the body without the spirit is dead. And then we read in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then the dust will return to the earth where it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. I don't know. Our, our, I still call him pastor. Uh, he, he's not my pastor at this church, but, but he's still my pastor. I don't know if you went to Francis Evans' memorial service or not. Ernest did such a great job of explaining this. Ernest is going to work the plan of salvation somewhere into whatever he does. Because when Francis died, her spirit vacated her body and went to be with the one who gave it. Keep that in mind, guys. And, and of course, I, I, I assume that, that God is hanging on to all of these spirits. Until, until the judgment day. And so I'm, I'm thinking that maybe that's what's happening. But, but it, you know, but the Spirit will return to God who gave it. So the unbeliever is not sick. Yeah, the unbeliever is dead. Now, this is what, this is what uh, Paul is trying to tell us in, in this whole thing here of, of Ephesians. The only difference between one sinner and another is the state of decay. I mean, so that, that's the only difference in, in, in one sinner and another. And this means that our world is a vast graveyard, guys, filled with people who are dead while they live. First Timothy 5, 6 says this, But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Now, disobedience was the beginning of man's spiritual death. In Genesis 2.17, we read this. For the day you eat of the tree, you will surely die. God is telling Adam and Eve some real serious stuff. And in Genesis 3.4, we see the, 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 the spirit in this world say this. Oh, you surely will not die. No, it just means you will know things that God knows. And he don't want you to know them right now. So anyway, see, this is, this is the big game that we play. That, that, and so it, that was the beginning of spiritual death. God, there's three forces in the world that encourage man in his disobedience. The world itself, the devil, and the flesh. Now, the world puts pressure on all of us to conform to this world. And now, you know, what Romans 12, 2 says this, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, see, Jesus is not of this world. And his children are not of this world. Now, the, the devil then steps in, and he does his part to encourage us in disobedience. The devil is described as this, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. As we just read that, it's, it's in the world. You see, Satan and his minions 
they influence the lives of all unbelievers and seek to influence the lives of believers. You know one thing? Satan is a liar. You know that. He's a liar. John 8, 44 said he's the father of lies. So guys, don't believe the lie of Satan. Don't spend our time meditating on the lies of Satan. Oh, you're not going to die. That just God just doesn't want you to know this. I, you know, I, I have these voices in the background talking to me all the time. I don't know about you, but they're always talking to me about stuff like that. And sometimes I say, wait, what did it say that again? I mean, that sounded good. <laughs> now, sometimes we dismiss those thoughts. I have to dismiss thoughts many times in my life. And then there's the flesh. That's what the flesh is lust, Scripture said there as we read. It, and it's the third force that encourages believers to disobey God, you know. See, Paul is not referring to the body physically here. He, the, see, the body is not sinful. The body is neutral. But what it is, see, the flesh refers to the fallen nature we're born with. And the nature wants to control our body and our minds. So when, when, it, when we begin to be controlled by our body and our minds and our thought process, then it encourages us to disobey God. Let me ask you this. I, I, I know Tricia could answer this question, but why does a dog do what he does? Because he has a dog's nature. It's exactly right. You transplant a cat's nature in a dog and watch him change. Why does a sinner behave like a sinner? Because we have the nature of a sinner. Guys, keep that in mind when we think about that. I just, verse 3, it says, By nature we are children of wrath. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means we're condemned already. We are already condemned. John 3.18, just two verses after John 3.16, remember? If my math is good. It says, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We are children of wrath. I want to read the next verse. And we may, we may camp here the rest of the time. But God. But God. But God. The only one that stands between the sinner and hell. The word but in scripture often reintroduces the message of the gracious and compassionate intervention of God in our lives. The simple term captures the nature of God also. He redeems, he resurrects, he makes all things new. All seems to be lost. We seem, it seems there's no way out. It seems we, we cannot get over the hump. And then we hear, but God. But God. As I tell you, it's got to be one of the favorite words in the Bible. I hope you never read that verse again without thinking about some of these things. But God. Something was lost, but now it's found. Someone was dead, but now they are alive. Someone was blind, but now they see. Some said there was no way, but God made a way. I'm going to bore you with a few more of these. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful. 
I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. When they had conducted all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish his purposes. The focus now is on God and what he did on behalf of sinners. You remember when Abraham and Sarah were traveling south to Egypt? And old Abraham, and now I have to tell you, Sarah must have been a 12 on a scale of 10 or something like that. Because when they were going down there, he said, you know what, Abimelech, is going to see how beautiful you are, Sarah. And, and he's going to kill me and take you. Well, he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll just I'll introduce you as my sister. Well, he, uh, then God wouldn't bother him. Abimelech took Sarah into his harem, like you would expect. But God <laughs> came to Abimelech. No, 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 no. Israel, his father, said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you. Saul sought David every day, but God did not give him into his hand. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock in the ark. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he would loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. But God's firm foundation stands. But God shows his love for us, and then while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But God. We were a mess, but God moved in. Now, right now, I'd like for some of you to tell me a but God moment in your life. Guys, we all have them. We all have them. So you be thinking about one of these in a moment. We were a mess, but God moved in. I was, a, I was having problems, but God. I, I, I was on the way to destruction, but God. Some of you share a but God moment in your life with the class here. I'm willing to wait. We got, we got 10, 12 minutes yet, so. Yes, Faith. Amen. Thank you, Faye. Someone else, but God. Yes, Barbara. Breast cancer with Barbara, but God healed it. Someone else. Amen. Thank you, Emmett. Someone else now. We all got but God moments. Yes, Darlene. Uh, I, the apartment complex went up on my rent and I couldn't afford it, but God provided me an apartment real close to the church because I said I wouldn't give up my church. A Amen. Thank you, Darlene, for that. Uh, you know, we, we'd probably had to take up, a, Glenn Dean would have probably taken up a collection to help pay that rent this, because of your work in the nursery. But <laughs> Trish. Uh, uh, I was severely depressed by God. You know, I, I think we all have been there in one form or another when we get severely depressed. But God. Mm -hmm. But God. 
You know that old saying, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, but God. Jerry, I saw your hand. Amen. But God is making him well now. Pam. We have a story about God. I mean, he had his heart attack last year and he's here. Thank God. Amen. Jerry's going to have some more testing tomorrow, but God's going to take care of it. Someone else, guys. I don't don't make me call on somebody now. I, I can speak on behalf of my sister. Um, she was pregnant with twins, and um, they both died from uh, twin to trans, twin to twin transfusion. But God allowed her to get pregnant again, and I have a nephew. So oh. he's twelve now, eleven or twelve. So. Amen. Um, Thank you, Trish. Well. We know we all have them, don't we? We have the but God moments in our lives. Guys, let's, let's dwell on those things. Let's think and praise God for those moments. And, and here's Paul just saying, you know, guys, you've been through all this. I've, I've tried to tell you uh, the, the, the benefit that you have in Christ. And now I'm telling you your position in Christ is solid. And then... He talks about all that we're into, the trespasses and sins, and, and how that we're children of disobedience, and by nature we're children of wrath, and but God, but God. In verses 4 through 7, uh, we, we read, uh, I, I, let me just go ahead and read the rest of those verses, because I couldn't get past verse 4 with that but God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. When he says, for we are his, that's God's workmanship. That's, someone referred to that as God's poetry. Maybe his workmanship. Verses 4 through 7 of that chapter means that God works for us. In verse 8, God works in us. And in verse 10, God works through us. And in verse 11, God works among us. That's what God does. See, God loved us. Love is an attribute of God. Now, but, he, but when directed to sinners, it becomes grace and mercy. His love to you and I are grace and mercy. But that's love. And he quickened us. It says he quickened us. He made us alive, guys. He made us. Uh, we're not spiritually dead anymore. We're alive in Christ because of the implanted spirit in our lives. And, and he exalted us. God exalted us. We're, we're not raised from the dead and left in the graveyard, guys. We're united with Christ and we share his throne. That's what the scripture just said. Physically, we may be on earth. Spiritually, our position is in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just like Lazarus, we've been called from the grave to sit with Christ and enjoy his fellowship. He John 12, 1 and 2, it's how that after Lazarus was raised, he joined his family, his earthly family there with fellowship. God keeps us. His purpose in our salvation is that all eternity the church might glorify God and his grace. 
And guys, get, get this in mind. Since we've not been saved by good works, we cannot be lost by bad works. Now, keep that in mind. Grace means salvation completely apart from any merit on our part. Grace means God does it all. In, in Ephesians 2.10, let's just finish up with, with that 10th verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Walk in them simply means live your life in that way. Our conversion, guys, is not the end. It's actually the beginning of life. It's not the end of life. God's purpose is to make us more like Christ. That's what that word sanctification means, becoming more like Christ the longer you live and the longer we, uh, we strive on this earth. Now, many people, many Christians actually think that conversion is the only important experience we have in life. But God is through the word, it's through prayer, it's, it's through suffering that God works in you. Think about this, women. God spent 40 years working in Moses before he could work through him. Moses was quite the character in, down in Egypt. Joseph suffered 13 years before God put him on the throne in Egypt. David suffered many years as an exile before gaining the throne. Paul spent three years in Arabia after his conversion. You see, what, what this is trying to tell us, guys, is that God must work in us before he can work through us. God must work in us before he can work through us. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good work. John Calvin said this, It is faith alone that justifies but faith that justifies can never be alone. I love some of these quotes these old guys have. We're saved by a faith that works, guys. We're saved by a faith that works. Many believers minimize the good works in the Christian life. Well, what are the good works in the Christian life? We, we, we could name dozens of them, the good works that we can do. But Matthew 5, 16 encapsulated this, I think, when it says this. Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's what God wants us to do. Let our light shine so that people can see the glory of God in you. All right. And Kim is here with us now. That's okay, Kim. We're, we're about to leave, but we're glad you're here for whatever it is. Any other thought or word before we go? Uh, Lisa, it's good to have you with, with Jerry this morning. I'm glad you could be here. And, and I know that, uh, you know, no matter how old we get, we still love our kids to be around, don't we? And they're great helps, aren't they, Jerry? Amen. And I want to thank all of you for your love and support and prayers for my father and his challenges over the last six months. It means very, very much to me, to him, and to our family. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa, for that. Well, we know. And as Jerry said, but God. But God wasn't ready for him just yet. And he's got something else for him to do here. But God is going to show him what it is. Any other thought or word before we go, guys? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and, and we'll be dismissed from here. Our Lord, we, uh, we're sometimes a mess in our lives. But God clears the mess up. Lord, we thank you that you're in the business of, of fixing messes. And Lord, you're in the business of doing miracles. And Lord, that young lady up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, needs a miracle this day. And God, would you provide that for her? Lord, we, we just ask you to do that. Selfishly, we may be asking for a miracle. 
But, Lord, that's what we ask for, that that you will heal her body. And those four young children will have their mom back. Lord, we just ask you to do that this morning. God, we ask your presence with us in in the service to follow. God, we pray you'll anoint Jim in a special way this morning, and God, he'll speak to our hearts, that we'll have an open heart, that, that we will be engaged in, in what you're trying to do in our lives. And God, we'll just bless you and praise you because you are the one that made us alive. You're the one that implanted that spirit in our lives, and we thank you for that. And we'll eternally thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you can you can Google it. Yeah.